um, brilliant um, wide range of answers. So um, we'll certainly be dealing with a lot of these um, factors that you've mentioned in the first module as we talk about the quite wide range of risk factors that kind of increase the chances of criminality. So some of these are to do with biological factors, some are to do with the developmental process in the home, some are to do with learning. Um, and the first one we'll talk about in the first lecture next week um, will be the kind of more situational um, factors. So, you know, there's a number of debates relevant to this, one of which is the nature and nurture debates, whether, you know, human behavior, differences in human behavior, including criminal behavior, are more to do with nature. So um, biological influences are more to do with nurture, environmental influences, um, which is a debate that we'll come to probably next week. Um, but one long standing debate in psychology, a different one than the, a different one than the nature nurture debate that I want you to be aware of is the person situation debate, which is, is it the person themselves that determines how they'll act in a situation or in a particular um, point in time? Or is it the situation that they're in, okay, that impacts them and causes them to then act um, in a particular way? So, you know, this is relevant throughout psychology, but in terms of criminal behavior, the person side of the debate would be more about arguing its personality traits that are maybe inherited or maybe are innate or, you know, are a crucial component of who that person is. And it's those factors that are causing cr criminal behavior, okay, that some are more quick to anger, some um, are more patient, some are more likely to think about the consequences of their actions. Whereas the situation argument would be that some people commit crime, like you said, maybe because a opportunity presents itself and that's what influences them, or maybe because they're born in poverty and they don't see any other way out and they don't see any other opportunity. And so it's the situation that they're in that causes them to act in a way that's criminal. Now, I'll go into more detail on this in the next lecture. But what we'll talk about is that really for a long time, the person side of the debate was more popular in psychology, really up until about the 1960s, which is really when social psychology began to massively emerge. Um, <clears throat> but in the 1960s, there was a real kind of um, counter argument that was um, um, growing and growing in popularity to this, really led by Michelle, um, a social learning theorist. And um, he really argued that it's the situation that determines um, people's behavior. And, you know, this was largely coming through social psychology experiments, some of which you might know, like um, the Stanley Milgram studies, which showed that, you know, people were quite likely to obey authority in particular situations. OK, there isn't a whole amount of individual differences in certain scenarios when one feels peer pressured, like in the Solomon Ash studies. We'll talk more about this next week. but. In particular scenarios, when one feels peer pressure, they give in and they conform to the group. OK, again, there isn't a whole lot of individual differences. Um, and other studies like this, too, like um, Zimbardo's Stanford prison experiment, OK, in which people kind of took on the identity that they were given, whether they were made a guard or a prisoner. Again, we'll talk more about these studies next week. But these were some of the studies emerging at the time that were really um, giving popularity to social psychology and this argument that it's really the situation that governs behavior rather than the person themselves. Um, and Michelle was really at the forefront of this, really leading this argument. And Michelle was appearing also in a lot of um, you know, late night talk shows and really communicating this, not just to the psychology community, but really to the general public, um, telling them about the kinds of studies that were happening and why the situation was so much more important than any kind of personality traits or any kind of personal characteristics. Um, he kind of mainly argued the situation is more important. Personality traits are not useful predictors for future behavior. Um, personality assessments are a waste of time because they differ in their methods and because of social desirability. So they're not really accurately measuring people's actual personality, but only how they want to be perceived in terms of their personality. 
And his review of the literature told us that correlations between personality and behavior very rarely exceeded 0.4, okay? And so this is a small to moderate correlation, right? Um, a correlation is a number between zero and, and one or zero and negative one, right? If it's a positive correlation, it's between zero and one. The closer to one it is, the stronger the association, the closer to zero, the weaker the association. So the fact that personality and behavior correlate with each other very rarely above 0.4, according to Michelle, would tell us that personality isn't having a great influence on behavior. There's other things happening other than personality. Now, the situation perspective, and particularly Michelle's work, really halted personality psychology for a couple of decades. Um, it really fell into disfavor to study, dis to study personality traits or anything to do with personality. And it wasn't really until the 90s that it was really really picking back up and psychologists were um, coming up with counter arguments to Michelle's points and that personality psychology was becoming again more popular. Um, but you know some rebuttals they eventually came up with to Michelle's criticisms were that his review of the literature was pretty unfair. He was really kind of selecting those that would support his arguments. And pretty much all of these conclusions were based upon lab studies in which you know, the situation is pretty strong, right? Um, so, you know, for example, um, the Stanley Milgram study, it's, you know, an unusual situation to be in, right? When you're put in this sort of lab and there's a researcher telling you how to act, okay? This isn't really giving us a whole lot of insight into real life, okay? The personality psychologists were arguing that in real life, personality traits are having more of an influence, okay? Because when the situation is more ambiguous, okay, this is when individual differences have an impact, okay, and we all choose to act differently. Um, you know, they also argued point four is actually not that small of a correlation. You know, it's explaining a significant proportion of the variance. So, you know, if I give you an example of that, you know, a number of studies again and again have found that the correlation between exam grades and conscientiousness, which is a personality trait, is 0.4, okay? So students who are more conscientious, more likely to attend class, more likely to submit assignments on time, more likely to do work rather than procrastinate and so on. So it's a personality trait that correlates with exam grades. Um, it explains 16% of the variance, okay? Again and again and again in studies. So it's not explaining all of the variance, obviously, okay? There's other things that matter, IQ, how interested you are in the subject, maybe what's happening at home. Okay, a whole bunch of other factors that can influence your performance in a class. Okay, but conscientiousness is one part of the picture. Okay, it's one part of the puzzle that's again and again found to be relevant. So it's needed to give us the full picture to give us actual insight into what's causing differences um, in this case in exam grades, for example. Um, and also that traits clearly exist, which is really the essence of Gordon Alpert's lexical hypothesis which is that um, in our language, we've came up with the main ways of describing the differences between people, okay? So there's a word for tidiness because some people are more tidy than others, okay? There's a word for being sociable because some people are more sociable than others, okay? So the fact that we actually have labels, okay, that we use to apply to pretty stable patterns of behavior, that itself demonstrates that personality traits exist, okay? Otherwise, it wouldn't have came about in our language. <clears throat> And so nowadays, psychologists really accept that both the person and the situation matter, okay, in terms of um, causing um, differences in behavior. And this is really called interactionism, okay, that what happens is a result of both the situation and the person, okay. Um, you know, the personality of the participant can impact the situation that they're in. And the situation that they're in could also impact their personality. Okay. Um, some people find themselves in certain scenarios, situations because of their personality. I'll come back to these examples on the next slide. Uh, but also, people can consciously manipulate the situations that they're in, okay, using maybe certain personality traits. So, one example of 
interactionism is situational selection. So you select particular scenarios based upon your personality. Okay. If you're a sensation seeking person, you know, you're more likely to seek out um, going skydiving or riding a roller coaster at a theme park or, you know, something that's congruent with that personality traits, right? If you're extroverted and sociable, you're more likely to seek out social situations, go to parties and so on. You're more likely to um, engage in these sorts of situations. So people select different situations based upon their personality. And we can think of, you know, examples of this in terms of understanding criminal behavior, right? If one is maybe sadistic, for example, they're more likely to seek out a situation in which, you know, they can feed that sadistic pleasure. Or if they're sensation seeking and thrill seeking, they're more likely to seek out something that will get them excited and something that will um, get them, you know, physiologically aroused. Um, second of all, people can evoke differences in the situation based upon their personality, not even deliberately or consciously, right? If you're a very disagreeable, argumentative person, you might find yourself in a lot of arguments in comparison to someone who's more easygoing and not very disagreeable, okay? And, you know, it's maybe not deliberate, okay, but it's just the way in which you act with people, the way in which you behave in social situations is having a particular impact, okay, and how this situation responds to you, okay? And then the other example of interactionism is more deliberate, more conscious, okay, which is manipulation, okay? People can, you know, manipulate the situation that they're in, okay, based upon maybe what they want out of it, right? Maybe you want to be particularly charming to someone because you want to get on their good side, okay? Um, or something such as that. <clears throat> but also there's differences in strengths of situations, okay? So some situations are not very ambiguous and they might bring about a quite specific response, okay? So for example, maybe you're not typically an anxious person, okay? It's not, you know, really a part of who you are every day, okay? It's not a main personality trait of yours. But in some situations, like when sitting a test, for example, you do get anxious, okay? So there might be some situations that bring about a particular trait within you. But then some situations are strong, meaning that people act pretty much all the same, okay? You know, this is a lecture, you know, there's not some of you running around and some of you dancing, some of you jumping up and down, you're all pretty much behaving in the, pretty much the same way. Because there's an idea of how you're meant to behave in a lecture, right? And the same at a funeral, right? People typically behave pretty much in the same way at a funeral because there's a kind of general understanding of how you behave in that sort of situation. But some situations are more weak, they're more ambiguous, okay? It's more open in terms of how you should behave in this situation. And that's more the case when personality will have an impact, okay? When some people will, you know, be more sociable or some will be more reserved, okay, depending upon their disposition. Okay, so really all I want you to really take away from what I've said today, um, other than the kind of broad overview of forensic psychology, is understanding what the situation person debate is, what interactionism is, and some of the examples I've covered there of interactionism, situational selection and manipulation. Um, and then in the next lecture, um, I'm going to go more fully into the situational risk factors um, for violence.